Um, this is really an exciting kind of kickoff or launch to in basically learn from all of you and um, offer those interested an overview of this um, highly innovative, um, what we think is a first in kind a member program um, that will be available to all SVS members. Um, and I'm really excited to uh, co-moderate the session with my wellness task force co-chair and partner in crime, Dr. Mal Shahan, who all of you know as the professor of surgery and medical director at um, LSU Health in New Orleans. So welcome, Dr. Shahan. Thanks, Don. This SVS webinar is focused on the background of surgical coaching, specifically for physician wellness. Um, we'll be learning about the coaching program and its impact from um, our coaches and our collaborators. And so I'd like to start our hour off by introducing to all of you um, our first speakers and our collaborators from the Academy for Surgical Coaching, um, Dr. Caprice Greenberg, who is the Moritz Mansberger Distinguished Chair of the Department of Surgery at the Medical College of Georgia at Augusta University. Um, this, uh, this transition will be effective, I think, in early May, or was in effect in May of last year, and she is a surgical oncologist specializing in breast cancer and a health services researcher with a focus in quality and safety. Dr. Greenberg has founded several organizations to ensure that research impacts practice, including the Surgical Collaborative of Wisconsin and the Academy for Surgical Coaching. Dr. Kara King joins us this evening, and she is a member of the Cleveland Clinic Section of Minimally Invasive Gynecologic Surgery, and she is the Director of Benign Gynecologic Surgery, the Director of Innovation, and the Associate Program Directory of the MIGS Fellowship. She's obtained her Master's Degree in Medical Education from the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, and she also presently serves as the Vice President of the Academy for Surgical Coaching and is a surgeon coach through the same academy. <clears throat> she has earned multiple teaching awards for educational endeavors for both medical students and residents alike, including the Ellen Hartenbach Award in 2018 for Innovation and in Simulation. Dr. Andrew Yee joins us tonight. He is an educational scientist in surgery with an expertise in implementation science expert performance, video-based learning, and digital technologies. He defended his PhD in healthcare professions education at uh, Utrecht University on implementation of innovation and ethics using video-based learning in nerve surgery. And his educational research and outreach programs were performed at Washington University School of Medicine and are internationally recognized for accelerating adoption and implementation of new techniques in the subspecialty of nerve surgery. And finally, Dr. Adrian or Addie Ferber is with us tonight, and she is the creative team leader and the innovator and the executive director of the Academy for Surgical Coaching. Dr. Ferber helped found and launch the Academy for Surgical Coaching in 2019 after spending 15 years in academic research and healthcare, and she completed her postdoctoral fellowship at Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice and her doctorate in 2012 from the University of Wisconsin School of Pharmacy, studying the regulation of drug marketing and advertising. And so we've really um, found our ourselves aligned with a tremendously powerful collaborative team who's going to overview for you um, some of their work to date, why we think it matters in the area of, um, of wellness specifically, and, and a little more data that will kind of help, I think, um, parlay their work, um, past and now present, um, to the space that we care so much about. So welcome to all of you, and thanks for all of your work to date. It's been a joy to, to work with you, and I'm excited for everybody to learn from you this evening. Great, thank you so much, Don, and thank you everybody for joining us tonight to talk a little bit about surgical coaching. Um, so we will um, be giving you a presentation um, as a group. So uh, Kara King is gonna start us out and she's gonna give us an introduction to um, burnout and wellness and coaching. And she's going to talk to us about how coaching can help us to address some of the issues that we're facing related to physician burnout and wellness. Um, she's going to introduce the Academy for Surgical Coaching and then uh, give us an introduction to some of the theory that underlies um, coaching. 
I'll then take back over and provide a framework and some of the evidence for surgical coaching um, and the state of where we're currently at in terms of our evidence development. And then I'm going to turn it over to Addie, who's going to introduce the program and then um, is going to give you uh, just some next steps in terms of getting started. So Andrew, if you can go to the next slide, we do have a couple of disclosures as we get started. The Academy for Surgical Coaching is a not-for-profit service organization. Um, Karen and I are both unpaid members of the board. I do serve as a consultant for Johnson & Johnson on their Global Education Council and uh, Andrew Yi uh, has just joined Intuitive Surgical as a medical science manager there, uh, and Addie has no relevant disclosures. So I'm going to hand it over to Kara, and I'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you so much, Caprice, and thank you so much for the invitation to be here with all of you tonight. Again, we are just so excited for this initiative. So I want to start out talking a bit about burnout. You know, physician burnout has been a national health crisis for years, and this was before the onset of COVID. COVID has really compounded this crisis as we are all currently feeling right now. This has obvious impacts on physicians' well-being and physician safety, as we know, but also has consequences on patient health, the physician workforce, and really healthcare system costs at large. Solutions historically have been primarily targeted at the physicians, right? With snacks and free soup and social hours for decompression or massages over our lunch hour currently here. I'm not sure what a lunch hour is, but that's one of the solutions that have been proposed. It's been shown that many of the current proposed solutions do not address the underlying problem. And this profound lack of alignment between caregivers' values and the reconfigured healthcare system is really glaringly apparent. Next slide, please. So within the healthcare system, the steep growth in healthcare administrators as compared to the, phys the, the, the physician workforce growth is really quite astonishing. And this can further lead to this profound, really lack of alignment between system and the practice environment. Next slide, please. In regard to the attributable cost of physician burnout, as we discussed earlier, it's not insignificant. When looking at the cost of both physician turnover, as well as many physicians reduced clinical hours because of burnout in the United States, the estimated range is 2.6 to $6.3 billion per year. At an organizational level, the annual economic cost per employed physician is found to be about $7,600 per year. Again, not insignificant. Next slide, please. There have been multiple studies looking into possible solutions, and what has been clear is that physician burnout is best addressed when viewed as a shared responsibility of both the healthcare systems as well as individual physicians. Individually focused solutions, very much including small group programs, right, centered around promoting community, connectiveness, and meaning has been shown to be extremely effective. As surgeons, we really want autonomy, right? We want the ability to take control of our own practice in ways that are meaningful to our individualized practice. Next slide, please. So we're all very well aware of Dr. Coleman and her team's published paper um, that was absolutely incredible, really diving into these factors that are very specific for vascular surgeons um, and this level of burnout and depression. And overall, the, the results were quite striking, right? The prevalence of burnout was found to be 40, 41%, um, as well as 8% had considered suicide in the last 12 months. There were a lot of different factors that were attributed to this, right? Older age, physical pain that was found at the workplace, different grades of work safety. And with these findings, there was action items that took place based on these results. And really the action items that were found that we're going to implement are providing SVS members with evidence-based programs, really build resilience, mitigate burnout, and enhance wellness. It was also a priority to develop a community of caregivers committed to, com to really making these different um, um, collaboratives, right? Compassionate collaborative care that's really focused on leadership, team development, and again, focused to our individualized practice. Next slide, please. So through this work, it became really apparent that there were many synergies between these potential triggers for burnout and then the power of surgical coaching. I want to break this down just a little bit here. So again, we all are very much well aware of these triggers, physical pain, lack of control, right? More clinical volume in the setting of oftentimes decreased workforce um, and then different areas of conflict. Now, What's really um, been amazing is that the way that surgical coaching can target a lot of these areas of well-being. And we're going to take the next few slides to really break down what does surgical coaching mean and what is that 
um, how do we integrate that into our practice? But what you're going to see is that this core philosophy and these principles of surgical coaching truly synergize and align with these different triggers to really optimize well being. Things such as intentional guided peer support, really creating these relationships of psychological safety, these judgment free zones, and really helping surgeons build capacity in their practice to advance their performance. Co-learning um, is also a really powerful way to increase efficiency, help manage OR stress, communication techniques, resource utilization, how to identify barriers within our own individualized practice, and really increase a sense of agency, engagement, and growth. Next slide, please. So in regard to the Academy for Surgical Coaching, like Caprice mentioned, um, this is a nonprofit organization that launched back in 2019. And really it's based on over 20 years of research with Dr. Caprice Greenberg being one of our co-founders. Our vision is really to empower surgeons through surgical coaching to improve clinical performance, well-being, and ultimately patient care. Our vision is really to serve as a model of excellence, innovation, and collaboration for surgeons, and to really break down silos to bridge the disciplines of surgery, coaching, and technology to really advance the field as a whole. Next slide. So what is it that the Academy actually does? And we have a few main pillars that, that we do. So number one, we train surgeons to serve as peer coaches. And we're gonna break that down again in the next couple of slides and what that actually means. And to date, we have over 180 coaches currently trained, uh, surgeons currently trained to serve as coaches. We also offer individual peer surgical coaching where institutions or individuals can con contract directly with the academy for one on one coach pairing. We also serve as consultants to help organizations, including professional societies or industry, develop coaching programs from the ground up. And we also feel a great responsibility and truly enjoy serving as advocates to help shift the educational paradigm and integrate coaching into surgical education on all levels. And lastly, we greatly value our technology partners and industry and continue to expand on our video-based platforms and various types of assessment metrics. Next slide, please. So just to expand a bit on our surgical coach training, we offer in-person as well as virtual options to help surgeons gain the knowledge and mindset shifts really needed to be excellent surgical coaches. And because this, this really does take time and take dedication to expand this skill set. So this includes a six hour session where we discuss the fundamentals of surgical coaching and really how to operationalize these skills. It takes faculty development to really train surgeons on how to really integrate this philosophy. Next um, slide, please. So with this in mind, the SES Wellness Committee has paired together with the Academy, um, which we are so excited for this initiative, to design a three month program that aims to improve the skills the wellness, decision-making, teamwork, and really self-awareness of all the surgeons who join us. So during this three-month program, the coach and surgeon participant, they meet uh, about four times in a virtual setting to really achieve the goals that the surgeon participant has in these areas. And this is completely, completely designed by the surgeon participant. The goals that they bring to their coach are personal. And this psychologically safe space allows the true goals to come to the surface and help build this collab collaborative relationship to take the practice to the next level. Next slide, please. So with this being said, we wanna break down what exactly is this surgical coaching that we're talking about? Next slide, please. So overall, um, as our focus, our focus of coaching is a little bit unique. It's a little bit different than maybe previous models of coaching that you may have experienced or you may have um, utilized in other areas of your life. So surgical coaching is uniquely different from leadership coaching. It's also uniquely different from executive coaching or even wellness coaching overall. Surgical coaching is really focused on improving clinical and operative performance quality improvement, and ultimately patient safety that really elevates the well-being um, of the surgeon. Just as surgical coaching is uniquely different from these other types of coaching, it's also uniquely different from other traditional educational paradigms that we all have probably experienced, right? So namely teaching and mentoring, and we're all probably a lot more familiar with these other areas. The approach with teaching and mentoring is often much more directive with a perceived hierarchy. Teaching is often seeking specific answers through very directive questions, right? When a teacher asks a question, they're oftentimes looking for a very specific answer. Mentoring often includes answering directed questions, looking at past experiences. Now, coaching is unique because on, on, within coaching, it's really about asking open-ended questions and to allow this space for self-reflection and allow this space for self-discovery. It is very future-focused, and the coach is truly at service to the coachee. 
Next slide, please. So we like to use a couple different definitions at the Academy that really encompass this idea of coaching. So one, it's unlocking a person's potential to maximize their own performance. We also like the definition of helping an individual learn rather than teaching them. And this is so subtle, but really so important at really maximizing this coaching relationship. It's also providing objective and constructive feedback to help someone recognize what works and also what can be improved. Next slide. So when we think about how surgeons are trained and learn over time, there's an obvious performance gap once we are out in independent practice, right? So we complete our residency, we go on to complete a fellowship, we take our in-service exams and board exams, and once we pass these, we are fully minted surgeons ready to go out into the world. But as the ABMS vision statement points out, once we enter independent practice, all of our evaluations really shift and become summative. Even our continuous certification remains summative. This is despite the ABMS to really move away from this and more towards formative evaluations. If you think about it, feedback is no longer built into our daily practice once we graduate. And within the construct of our current model, this leads to a plateau, both in surgical innovation as well as expertise, right? Because feedback is critical to advance our performance. Without feedback, it is difficult, if not impossible, to really identify these gaps in our individual practice and really know how or where to make these intentional adjustments to continue to advance our expertise. Next slide, please. So we all know feedback's important, right? We think about it a lot, if we're educators especially, but when we think about it, how are we as surgeons, once we're out, actually getting this feedback? So on an individual level, surgeons often seek out these informal opportunities, right? These different conversations, maybe in the hallway, at the scrub sink, these different areas where we have conversations about our practice or a difficult case. However, even in our system that exists, such as surgical society meetings, feedback and the space for collaboration can oftentimes be in this group setting, right? It's not individualized necessarily to our unique practice. And the glaring problem with these models is that a systematic approach for feedback doesn't truly exist once we get out into independent practice. These informal interactions are often overall unfulfilling in regard to the long-term formative impact. There's not a lot of follow-up on this and it, it doesn't really allow for a sustainable way to look at our practice, look at our ideal state and know how to close this gap. This is one space that we think surgical coaching can truly excel. Next slide, please. And it's unique, right? Because this idea of coaching comes very naturally to us when we think about different areas, right? So we think about athletics um, or even in the arts, right? So next slide, um, with a voice coach or a coach for dance or photography, this is a very natural place for our brain to go. And even in the business world, leadership coaching makes perfect sense. It's really built into the culture of many of the business leaders that we know. As seen in these slides, coaches can be seen in these areas not only for amateur level athletes, right? But even for the elite to enhance the performance improvement at every single level. And a universal concept amongst all areas and types of coaching is that they all adhere to adult learning theory. So this individualized learning is goal-driven with active participation from the coachee. The coaching is tailored to the experience of the coachee in a really long-term and sustainable way. Performance improvement is based on setting individualized goals, allowing space for this guided reflection and feedback, and then intentional adjustment on those goals. And then once you make an adjustment, it's really critical to see how that change then impacts your practice and impacts your patients, and then shift and make a new goal based on those results. All right, I'm gonna shift over to you, Caprice, uh, to take over from here. Great. So as Kara was mentioning, one of the ways that we developed the concept of surgical coaching was really looking across all these different disciplines and trying to understand what it is that were these, um, these, these patterns that we could identify about what made coaching unique and then learning from these different disciplines about how we could apply it to improve performance in surgery and to help really to develop again that collaborative engaged approach to individualized learning. And so what this is, is a framework that helps us to just think about how we could form and develop coaching programs. So I just want to focus for the time being here on the focus of coaching and the activities of coaching. Uh, next slide. So when we think about the focus of coaching, it really tends to be in these um, four buckets. And these buckets are really um, artificial, but what they're, they're there to really give you a scaffolding for having a conversation about your performance, about the challenges that you face every day at work, and about being able to discuss where it is that you want to take ownership of your practice and really look to focus on your engagement and your continued improvement. 
So you can look at technical skills, you can look at cognitive skills, interpersonal skills. And then this concept of self-regulation was one that actually came out empirically from our research as we were studying coaching. We saw that people were really wanted to talk a lot about um, their stress response, what happened when things started not going so smoothly in the operating room, how they recognized it, how they responded to it, and then how they worked using their interpersonal skills to engage the rest of the team to support them when things weren't going smoothly. Next slide. So surgical coaching is really about bringing those two things together. So the surgical coach uh, uses the skills that Kara mentioned and that we teach through the uh, training program. So they, we, we teach people as a coach how to work with a practicing surgeon to identify what their goals are, because really they're the only ones who know where they need to improve their practice. We teach them to act, ask good open-ended questions to really challenge the person they're working with in a non-threatening way to get them to reflect again on their own practice and to have some self-awareness and self-assessment of where their gaps are. And then to really come up with a solid action plan and hold people accountable. I think one of the most important things about coaching is having that partnership where somebody holds you accountable. And then it's really up to the surgeon to figure out again, which are the areas of their practice that they want to work on that's going to give them the most satisfaction to improve and have the greatest impact on not only the care that they provide to their patients, but also again, their professional satisfaction and their engagement. Next slide. So video recording is one tool that can be used. It's not necessary, but sometimes it can help to anchor your conversation. It's also been shown that it can allow you to review your own performance and is more successful in sustaining behavior change. It's much easier to view yourself and to really understand what you're doing than to have somebody trying to describe to you what you're doing. It also confers a time savings of 50 to 80%. So coaches don't have to go and spend time in the operating room with another surgeon, which can be challenging. It removes concurrent responsibilities on the part of the surgeon so that they can really focus on and concentrate on their own performance assessment. And then it mitigates medical, legal, and credentialing complexities on the part of the coach. So we've done a bunch of research and we don't have time today to kind of go through all of this, but I do want to just highlight a couple of studies and then a couple of other points where we are in terms of development of coaching so that you can um, kind of decide where we're at and understand the importance of as we do this and undertake um, programs like this, really getting feedback and helping people, helping to understand how people um, view this and whether or not we actually are having an impact. So the next slide. Surgical coaching really supports continuing professional development. And so some of the highlights of those research projects on the last slide is that it's feasible and acceptable for busy surgeons in practice. In general, we tend to limit our coaching sessions to about an hour so that you um, really don't have to take give too much of a time commitment. There's high perceived value for individual professional development. There's been uh, data to show that it increases the safe adoption of new technologies and new procedures. It can improve teamwork, communication, and awareness in the OR, and it has the potential to improve surgeon well-being and patient outcomes. Next slide. So there have been a number of papers that have come out, and this one is just an example that we were involved in, um, which most recently looked at the impact of surgical coaching in bariatric surgery in the state of Michigan. And we found that in general, um, the uh, valuations were, were quite positive about um, the engagement. Next slide. Um, and we were able to show that we actually um, improved outcomes in terms as measured by operative time. So if you look at the participating surgeons, there was a 14 minute decrease in operative time for surgeons who participated in the coaching program. Now, as we start to develop this, um, the data to support coaching, it's important to understand what's happening in terms of policy. Next slide. And so the um, American Board of Medical Specialties um, published this vision for the future of continuing board certification in February of 2019. And if you haven't seen it, it's worth a read of just at least the summary statement because they really, I think, voice what um, at least personally has frustrated me about some of the ways that we've approached continuing medical education, which has been very focused on uh, group 
PowerPoint-based presentations where you go and you, you learn something and you're supposed to bring that back and you're supposed to somehow apply that in practice and make changes to your practice without really having a lot of support. And, and in reading this ABMS vision for the future, there's really this, this again, this focus or this understanding that, that so much of where we are as a discipline is, is disconnected, it's disjointed. There's not this integration between our learning and our practice. And I think that is contributing so, to some of our feelings of, of burnout and lack of well being. And so as we start to think about how we engage moving forward, thinking of that, that chart that Kara showed you at the beginning, right, where the feedback decreases, how do we move continuing certification from summative um, feedback to formative feedback so that we can figure out where our individual areas are that we can improve upon? Again, this idea that we should be using adult learning principles that learning needs to be individual and goal-directed. It needs to be timely, it needs to be repeated, and it, there has to be a gap analysis. Again, it has to be focused on what are the individual gaps that I have as a practicing surgeon that are gonna make me uh, better in terms of how I take care of patients and my own professional satisfaction. And then they talk about the importance of starting to address procedural skills, which often are not uh, impacted in this way. Next slide. And then if you can just skip to the next slide in the interest of time. So individual surgeon feedback really works by you get hooked up with between a coach and a practicing surgeon are matched and really sit down and come up with goals for their sessions and their time together. A coaching session takes place and in general, it usually tends to be around your practice as a way to um, to target and anchor the conversation. But the idea really is to have this protected space where a coach is working in service of you to help you just think about your career, think about your practice, think about the ways you take care of patients and really help to empower and engage you in taking ownership about how to make yourself better and to get that ongoing professional development. And so usually this takes place over the course of a series of coaching sessions. Next slide. The last point that I just want to make before I turn it over to Addie is that, you know, vascular surgery, I know, is a, is a um, really highly technical field. You guys are always have new, it seems like have new techniques, new procedures, new devices that, that you need to learn. And again, I think this is a place where sometimes we can feel unsupported as a field in terms of how do we adapt that into practice. And so this was a study that we did where we worked with uh, Johnson & Johnson to help coach surgeons who had gone through courses to try to learn how to use a new technology or a new procedure, but those people had not quite yet been successful in adapting that technology into practice. So it's sort of an adjunct to the usual types of educational activities that we participate in. Next slide. And we looked at three months and then at a year, go ahead to the next slide, please and found that we were able to increase procedural confidence, increase technology confidence, and then increase goal progression for the participating surgeons in this program. So again, this is just one other way that coaching can help. And for each individual surgeon who participates in the coaching program, what you focus on is gonna be different. For some people, it's gonna be the ways that you interact with the residents in the OR. For some people, it's gonna be the ways that you interact with your colleagues in nursing or in anesthesia. For others who um, it may be their technical skills, wanting to be more efficient in the ways that they move through practice, or it may target some of the systems challenges that you're facing, or it may be, how do I start to, how do I get more relevant and take up new technologies? If, again, it's not about the education, but it's about how do I adapt that into practice? How do I make changes in my practice? So Addie is now going to walk us through just a little bit more information about the program. Thanks so much, Caprice. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to make sure to introduce myself uh, because I will be helping with the day-to-day -day running of a lot of the surgical coaching program. So if you're interested in participating in the program, working with a coach, um, I'll be the person on the other side of those emails. I just wanted to make sure we have name and face. I also want to make sure you have a, let you know about kind of the experience of getting started with a surgical coach um, as you're thinking about uh, what it might entail if you were to join in this program to help improve your practice through surgical, working with a surgical coach. 
Two important links. One is there is a page at the Society for Vascular Surgery's webpage about the coaching program where you can get some of your questions answered, see a list of the coaches, and learn more about the program. And also, very importantly, surgicalcoaching.org slash SVS is the place where you go to sign up. Next slide, please, Andrew. Thanks. So here's what you might expect at the beginning of starting to work with your surgical coach. Um, you contact the Academy for Surgical Coaching, and we ask a couple quick questions about you and a little bit about your practice and a little bit what you might think you might be interested in working with with your coach. It's early in the process. You might not have a great idea, just some idea. Let us know and we can use that information to help match you up with a really great coach that has knowledge and interests that overlap with yours. The first step then is to set up a short introduction call with your coach, usually about 30 minutes. We can do it over video or over the phone, whatever is convenient and accessible for you and your schedule, because we know everybody is so busy. We get that connection put up and build some rapport, get to know each other if you haven't met before, ask some questions and see if you think you're a good fit, if you think uh, is someone you'd like to talk with more about your practice. If you decide to move ahead with that coach, uh, we will go ahead and create a coaching agreement. And that's a document between you and your coach that outlines kind of the basics of what you're gonna do together, how often you'll meet, what technology you'll use to communicate, what your goals are for improvement, and some idea, if you have it, of how you might uh, measure and evaluate your change. Once that is in place, uh, you then start in kind of the meat of the coaching engagement, where you and your coach meet virtually over Zoom, one-on-one, -on -one, for usually about an hour, once a month. In this program, you'll meet once a month for, again, about an hour. Over three or four months is enough time to get you moving along in uh, achieving your goal, making some changes, and seeing what works. This continues on until you're uh, coming to a point where you can wrap up that coaching engagement. And at the end, we ask you to uh, spend some time with your coach reflecting on the experience, both giving feedback to each other to help each other improve, help your coach get better as part of coaching too, and also share a little bit about the program with the Academy so we can help continue to tailor these programs to be really, really great for you. Next slide, please. Again, as I mentioned, uh, the Society for Vascular Surgery has a page where you can get some more information. Um, and last, uh, next slide, please. The page at the Academy for Surgical Coaching is where you sign up. A couple other things to add about this specific SVS program. Uh, you get basically one CME per hour of coaching, so up to four CME for participating in the program. There is a $925 fee for participating that's subsidized by the Society for Vascular Surgery through gracious support from their sponsors. Um, and that's uh, payable up front when you start the coaching process. So that wraps up kind of a summary of what is surgical coaching, how you might be able to make some changes to your practice working with a surgical coach. And again, if you'd like to take that next step at the end of the presentation, you'll go uh, to surgicalcoaching.org slash SVS to sign up. I think this will wrap up the section from the Academy for Surgical Coaching. Um, Dawn says we are going to do a quick poll real quick. Um, to ask about your interest in working with in surgical coaching and working with a surgical coach. Once that poll is done, we will have uh, Dr. Nitin Singh come on to talk next. Dr. Ferber, thank you for that. Dr. King, Dr. Yi, and Dr. Greenberg, that was a really beautiful overview of the program. For all that are joining us this evening, there's a poll that we'd love your response to now, kind of querying your interest in surgical coaching, so please respond. <clears throat> I wonder if we're gonna pull up the second poll now. I will end this one, stand by. Thank you. 
And perhaps while we're waiting for the next poll to go live, um, I would like to introduce Dr. Nitin Singh, um, who you all know um, from our society. He is a professor of surgery at the University of Washington, the associate chief of the Division of Vascular Surgery and current program director for their integrated residency and fellowship. Prior to joining the University of Washington, Dr. Singh served in the United States Army and had two combat deployments in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. He's been an instrumental partner um, for us um, as a wellness task force member and essentially kind of led our early efforts in pushing forward this coaching program and um, really did a tremendous amount um, during 2021 um, when time was restricted and other things were challenged. Um, but I'm so grateful for his partnership and support. Um, Mal and I really appreciate your work. Nitin, thanks for being here this evening. Um, and you're going to review with us all a bit about um, the coaching program as it applies to um, kind of our early stages of creation and implementation. So thanks for joining us this evening. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Mal. Well, you know, obviously you've, you've had a nice overview by the A4C, 4SC team uh, that talked about the surgical coaching and, 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 and the importance of this. But I, I'd really like to, to say that this idea was championed by uh, Dr. Coleman. And, you know, we all know that on the wellness committee, this is something that uh, Don has been working on for quite a, a while. And uh, I think the remainder of us were, were, you know, just followed her lead on it. And it's been, uh, it's been wonderful to see this come to fruition. And it's here. So the goal is to create a program to train our members to become coaches. And then after you train these members, you want to have them assist our members in need of completing the appropriate coaching training. I think everyone believes that they can mentor people. But there's a difference between being a mentor and a coach, as we've heard from the A4SC folks. And I, and I think that that's what the coaches and the coaching training uh, allows for. So it is a time commitment for those that are interested in, uh, in being part of the coaching program. And that's, uh, it requires eight hours of surgical coach training, the coach, uh, and then coaching three surgeons over a three to four month uh, time period. Each session is about an hour and the total time coaching is approximately 18 hours over three to four months. So there is some time involved, but I think it's one of those uh, aspects of, of selecting the right people that want to be coaches and, and commit to this and helping, helping other uh, members of our society. There are term limits. Coaches are certified uh, through A4SC for two years. You do receive an honorary of $1,000 a year and a $1,000 coaching training fee has been paid for by the SBS. And you can earn up to 13 hours of CME credit. So there is something that you're getting back from this as well on top of the, the benefit of coaching our members. What attributes um, do you look for in a coach? And and, you know, these are things I think we all know, uh, broad knowledge and expertise in vascular surgery, practicing or retired vascular surgeons in good standing, history of excellent outcomes, exceptional reputation with the peers, passion for teaching and mentoring, commitment of service to the profession. You want somebody who's a superb communicator and a great listener. Uh, I think those, those traits are very uh, necessary for a good coach and a high level of self-awareness. So how do we do this? How do we select the coaches? Well, we identify candidates. Uh, uh, we use the wellness committee members um, and nominated uh, many of them. Uh, nominations from the leadership council and the DEI council, as well as uh, members that self-nominated. Uh, we then put together a, a list uh, for review for the uh, SBS executive board to uh, confirm uh, the, the members and ensure that the coaches met the SBS criteria. And these are our final member of coaches. An outstanding group, Dr. Shipra Aria, Dr. Carlos Bichara, Dr. Jean Bismuth, Dr. Don Coleman, our very own, Dr. Lori Drudy, Dr. Matt Eagleton, Dr. John Eight, Dr. Mark Matos, and Dr. Daniel McDevitt. We have Dr. Erica Mitchell as well, Dr. Alina Garoga, Dr. Amy Reed, Dr. Vincent Rowe, and Dr. Russ Sampson, Dr. Jess Simons, Dr. Ravi Viraswamy, Dr. Gabrielle Velasquez, and Dr. Max Wollauer. So this is our initial group of coaches. And uh, you can see that that is, is one heck of a group. And we look forward to them assisting our members in need and also becoming ambassadors for the program. I think when you select people to be the initial kind of cohort in, in any kind of program, you want them to, to train and do a great job, but then recruit other people. And that's what we want them to do is to recruit future coaches and formulate changes from lessons learned on their initial experience. And I think that uh, 
you know, we've got a great start to this. And again, I'd, I'd really like to give credit to, to Don and Mal and the whole wellness uh, committee for, for continuing to, uh, to push the agenda. And, uh, you know, it's been a fantastic ride and I, it's, it's great to see this program starting. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, John. I think we have Drs. Uh, Eagleton and, and, uh, and Dr. Reed who are gonna be uh, talking about coaching experience. Yeah, Nitin, thanks so much. That was a really nice overview. Um, and really to your point, um, this task force has really been conceived, been we convened about three to four years ago. And so there has been a lot of work kind of building up to this, um, this time point. And so we're super excited. Um, and I really credit the engagement, really the enduring engagement of a lot of different individuals that have been supporting this work. So thanks for being such a huge part of that. We'll move on to the next section of, um, of the webinar. And I would like to introduce, as Dr. Singh referenced, um, Dr. Matt Eagleton, the Chief of the Division of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery at the Massachusetts General Hospital. He holds the Robert R. Linton Professor of Surgery Chair at the Harvard Medical School. Dr. Eagleton is the co-director of the Mass General Fireman Vascular Center and the co-director Director of the Mass General Thoracic Aortic Center. His clinical and research work focuses on the treatment of complex aortic disease. And additionally, he has been involved in the MGH Physician Coaching Program and now serves as a Society for Vascular Surgery, um, Vascular Surgery Coach. Dr. Amy Reed joins us tonight as the Director of um, M, Minnesota Health Fairview Vascular Services Service Line and the Professor in Chief of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. And Dr. Reed oversees vascular services across the 10 hospital system. She is a member of the board of directors for M Health Fairview University of Minnesota Physicians. She is the current secretary of our Society for Vascular Surgery, the immediate past president of the Association of Program Directors in Vascular Surgery, and she served a, ten, a seven year term on the Vascular Surgery Board of the the ABS. She co-edits VSAP 5 and VSAP 4, and she is on the editorial board of the Journal of American Surgery and the Journal of Vascular Surgery. Dr. Reed completed her general surgery residency and fellowship at Harvard Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, and also is serving as a, as a surgical coach for this program. Um, and so thank you both for being here. And I'm going to turn it over to you. I believe you're going to share a bit about what the experience has kind of felt like for you as early and active coaches. Um, and maybe share some examples. So thanks for being here tonight. Great. Thank you, John. John. Hey, Amy, good to see you. You too. I'd like to thank everybody for allowing us to do this. It's been a, a pleasure. It seems like it just happened yesterday, our coaching, but I think it was a few more months ago than that. Our, Amy, I, we're gonna run this as a little question and answer. Um, and I, I've, maybe I'll start out asking you some questions about your coaching experience. How, what was your coaching training like and what did you take away from it? What was the big picture message? Well, I, you know, I have to say, Matt, I'm probably going to use a lot of Ted Lasso res references <laughs> here because I felt, I felt like uh, when Ted's at his first press conference and knows nothing about uh, uh, European football. And so I think we all really felt like, uh, okay, we've mentored people, but the coaching is that subtle difference. And I think um, it sounds funny, but I, I, I really, I think the Ted Lasso thing kind of hit home with it. And, and we started with it. Um, it was a Saturday in July. We had the, uh, um, you know, coaching session and uh, really the information about doing it during the day and really um, spent about, I think about six hours on a Saturday, really getting down the differences between uh, mentoring and coaching. And, and I think there is some subtle differences, but when I think about uh, you know, mentoring where you're sort of sharing your skills and your experiences and trying to get somebody, you know, into down the road in a, in a certain venue or a certain leadership task or something. It's so different really than uh, it's different yet subtle about the coaching where you're really there completely in service for the, the person in front of you. And, and so I really, uh, you know, I kind of think about that, um, you know, if, you, if no one's, if you have not seen Ted Lasso, you should see it because I think it epitomizes so many things about the coaching program. That's great. It's a great analogy. I, I love that show. So, um, what, what aspects of vascular surgery do you think our members are going to look for and request coaching with regard to the most and which ones do you, I, I, my vision is that that's going to probably change over time and what we would be asking for now potentially would be very different than what we may have asked for three years ago pre-covid right you know i i think um you know as, as dr greenberg highlighted about the techniques and the technical aspects of our field 
Um, I, I've really, uh, you know, not heard as much about that aspect, I would say, as more about the interpersonal skills and the um, and some of the inner um, sort of self-regulation and interpersonal, like how do I uh, requests and, and questions are, how do I navigate this situation? How do I deal with this challenge with my, my partners? How do I deal with my you know, position in a society or in my organization? And um, you know, I, I want people who are interested in coaching to think about um, that the idea is not just, hey, how do I get better at cannulating branches in an NFV bar? Or how, and those are all super important. Uh, but I find that some of these other skills, I think, are, um, I think are things people are thinking about and struggling with as we're trying to get through the staffing issues and the COVID issues. Um, there's a lot of things that make, have made people just really frustrated and anxious. And, and so, uh, you know, I think that's, that's an area I see. Are you seeing it similarly? No, I am. I, I think um, I went into this with the perception that a lot of this was geared around potentially doing technical improvement in the operating and really coaching the sport of vascular surgery. Um, and even for our training, when we were asked to, to bring ideas to talk about when we did some shared sessions and some uh, coaching practice amongst ourselves, I don't think anybody was really at that time too keyed in on having performance improvements in the operating room that were technically related. A lot of this was more interpersonal related and then stress of life re related. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, um, you know, when people think about um, you know, their, their current positions and their career and what they're doing technically, I think um, many people voice they're, they're, they're comfortable or they're, they're satisfied with what they're doing technically. And that's actually sometimes like the best part of the job <laughs> or that, yeah. you know, you're in your zone in the operating room and you're, you're not having to deal with uh, people who are quitting or the constant barrage of people wanting some of the time for certain things or, you know, taking something away from you, uh, you know, either trainees or staff or so I think um, that's where I'm seeing that uh, it's been, you know, really enjoyable. I find myself, uh, I just really look forward to it. And um, really, you know, when you think about, we all went into medicine to help, help patients. And I think the coaching thing, being able to help our, our fellow surgeons is extremely rewarding. And I just look forward to, you know, kind of listening. And, um, and I think that's a, a key thing of the, the listening yeah, and I really agree. being in service to that person. We're giving them one hour, but it's in the in one hour of direct attention to what they're saying and understanding what their their goal is. Um, it, it, we all want to contribute. Hey, you should try this, but some parts of this are hard to sit back and let them struggle through it. Not even struggle through it, but just I, identify what they need to do themselves and just provide them with the the feedback board where you can say, yes, that sounds good, but what about this? And we'll, ask them questions to help them find their way. I find that a lot of fun. And it's certainly a practice that you learn over time. I don't think anybody goes into coaching being an expert coach right off the bat. Um. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, the, it is a process for both, uh, you know, the coachee and the coach themselves. And I think, um, you know, continue to, you know, I find myself even, I feel like it makes me a, a you know, better listener um, and really, uh, you know, you feel like you listen, but you know, this forces you to be a, a better listener and, and really uh, focus yourself to not share your side of things yeah. or share your like, oh, I had this case or, oh, I had this situation mm -hmm. and not jump into like, here's the solution. Cause we're so used to just offering, here's my answer. You know, like, I just want to give you the answer. And I think that part has been to just has made me, I think, be a little more just sit back and listen. And I, and I think that uh, has helped me as well. It's tough when we're, every day we're problem solvers and that's what we like to do is to solve some, solve everybody else's problems and to step back from that a little bit and let them figure out figure it out themselves in some fashion. Do you, you know, I guess one of the things I got concerned about if I, when I thought about peer coaching is how am I gonna be perceived by my peers? Um, and how are they going to perceive this as a becoming vulnerable to each other when we start talking about things that we're trying to overcome or goals we're trying to set? Even if it's a technical thing in the operating room, it's not easy for us to admit 
uh, we're looking for assistance or looking for help. But what do you think about that? In our yeah, I, I think membership. I, I think that that's so true. And I think vulnerability is a key is I think as overachievers, we're really hard on ourselves and um, we dwell on our mistakes. And, and again, the, the Ted Lasso reference of being a goldfish. And I don't say that in, in coaching, <laughs> but in my own mind, I try to think, yeah, you know, to try not to dwell on things. But I, I think um, trying to um, not take over the coaching session as like, oh, let me share about my experience. But I think you can be empathetic and understanding. And, and I think in that initial part of kind of getting to know each other, sort of, as was mentioned, sharing the war stories of like, oh yeah, I've been there. This, you know, and these are the th struggles, but just kind of separating that. Cause I, I, I think, um, uh, you know, again, we would all like to share our, you know, our sort of struggles with it. And I, I try not to kind of bring that forth, but I do think um, there's having that safe space. I think it, hopefully it makes it a space where, you know, our fellow SPS members um, could really, you know, feel comfortable in saying like, I'm having this issue with a per with this X person. And it, it, and the person I'm working with right now, it's actually, you know, a fairly well-known person. And, and, and I feel like, you know, we don't ever say the name, we just kind of, yeah. the person talks about it and in real general kind of terms. And, and uh, you know, I think there's a responsibility to, to be, um, confidential about it yeah. but just also understanding we're just all human overachieving people and we all make mistakes and you know trying to kind of forgive and move on uh, or just be the goldfish and not dwell on it and yeah. see how you can so that you can go forward it yourself yeah I, I agree I stress that to anybody listening that's interested in getting coaching all of it is completely confidential and nothing will be shared if you decide to uh, re, you know, tell us specifics about things that you're going through, although many times it can be addressed in some vagaries, but people do find out. Um, but you shouldn't be a worried about that going into coaching. This is all confidential, the conversations. So, Mal and Dawn, I don't know how much more time we have. We're a little bit over. Oh, thank you both. No, I think we're, we're fine on time. Um, and this has really been a brilliant discussion. I want to thank you both just for your engagement and your contributions to date and your leadership. Um, it means a lot. Uh, so thank you for that. It was a nice exchange. And I guess what I'll say is that, um, you know, the webinar is supposed to go until um, about eight o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So we have a bit of time left and I wanna make sure we capitalize on that and engage uh, the folks that are participating with some questions in the chat. Um, I think it's been a really um, excellent discussion and so we'll open it up right now. Um, and Mal, I just wonder as you've kind of perused the chat, if there's anything um, that, that you'd like to ask any of our speakers um, based on feedback from the group. And if not, I also have a few questions that we can put out there. Yeah, just a quick one, um, probably to Matt and Amy, actually, is you're both kind of leaders in your departments. What do you think um, about trying to get uh, the departments of surgery to subsidize these coaching um, platforms? Obviously, you know, the SBS is subsidizing a bunch of it, but there's still, you know, significant costs associated. But I think that you know, for uh, the bang for the buck, it seems like a no brainer for the departments to sponsor it, but I'm not sure what the temperature is out there with departments of surgery, surgery nationally on sponsoring these types of things. You know, I, I, I think that um, I sit on a, on a committee for um, continued professional enhancement, which basically is the compass reports and things coming in. And when we try to, I just got asked to do this thing and I'm trying to set this new tone of, just trying to help people and it's all in kind of the delivery and I think for the department chairs they already um, some of them already will offer when somebody comes into a position a leadership position some executive coaching and so I think my own idea was that perhaps the our you know ongoing professional enhancement and dealing with some of the compass or some of the behaviors could be helped and, and mitigated by some of this coaching because I think some of the things are just People are, are, are burnt, they're anxious, they're upset, the staff, all these things. And that's why I think maybe it'd be a way to say, hey, this would be a great investment um, in your faculty and might lead to some of the other coaching that maybe Matt's doing too, that you mentioned you was already doing in the department. Yeah, so 
I, I don't know what the flavor is like across the country, but at least at Mass General, they're very invested into the wellness of the everybody here, not just physicians, but I'd say the institution. And they've had an ongoing physician coaching program uh, for several years. And I was able to go through that almost in parallel when I was going through this one. And they're very similar, actually, although the Mass General one isn't directed just to surgeons. And I actually end up coaching um, some residents and fellows, which has been a great experience. Um, uh, I, you know, a place like this doesn't have, we don't have a lot of coaches for our peers and this might be a great outlet for them and something I'm, I'm sure they would take serious and in investing in. I, I love that. Thanks for that perspective. Um, I, I want to ask two questions to follow up on that a little bit, because I do think in some of our early work as a task force, thinking about um, coaching and peer support, it became very clear that our membership responds to, to peers, probably most, um, most particularly. And so, um, you know, Dr. Reed and Dr. Eagleton, as you're thinking about our membership and the wellness data that we have available to us, and now that you're so engaged with this coaching program, who do you think are members that would um, derive the most benefit from a program like this? Who should, who should consider coaching? And then my follow-up question is for Dr. Singh and all of our academy collaborators. And some thought went into kind of pulling um, active SVS members to serve as coaches. But when you think about partnering coaches and coachee, is there a secret sauce for that relationship? Um, so, so really two questions there directly to benefit the members listening. You know, you know I, I guess think... I would... Go ahead, Amy. No, go ahead, Matt. I was going to say, I, I don't think there isn't a member in our society that wouldn't benefit from a coaching session in some fashion. Then, now, the goals for them may, may be a little bit different depending on where they are in their career or what's going on in their life at the time. Um, but I think everybody could. So um, who needs it? Absolutely. If we look at your wellness survey, you can saw two, two columns of people who absolutely need it, um, but they may not recognize that they're in those columns. So I think that's a great idea to have things like this. So we can put it out there and say there are co there is coaching available. Um, if you even think about needing it, sign up for it. Get a coaching session. Uh, you'll benefit from it. Um, I've been coached in a whole number of different ways with some coaches, and it's, it's just been a spectacular experience. And I certainly am better because of it. Yeah, I think there's in all, all different areas and, and terms of vascular, uh, just speaking specifically for that, whether you're thinking about... Um, Am I still relevant? I'm, you know, as, as you know, is there somebody still, you know, going toward retirement and off ramping? Am I still relevant? How am I still relevant? People don't listen to me anymore. Not, <laughs> not saying so much for myself, but I have several uh, faculty who are are getting ready or are retiring, and and there's a, you know, I'm certainly no expert in that, but the relevance and the role you play, or early early career, mid career, as Matt was saying, I think really any of those stages. And I would just throw out a plug from, from the program directors for vascular. You know, when we do the survey of the, you know, us as educators, you know, the programs get all those, there's a, there's questions on there about, do you feel burnt out? Do you feel valued? I'd say, let's just, even if we just start with our educators and, and offer some like say, and we've done this with our system and say, Hey, here's the results of our, our study. Like, wow, there's like 40% of you who feel under, who don't feel like you're doing meaningful work or you don't feel. So I, I look at some of that as maybe, you know, some low hanging fruit to start with to, to say, you know, maybe if we got those people, you know, a bit more, um, you know, uh, helped with some coaching that might even then, then go forward even into the trainees a little bit more as well to model some of that behavior. But I think there's almost no one that, you know, almost everyone could benefit. And, and I myself have received coaching on a couple of different levels. And I think it's really helpful. I'd like to ask a question to the Ameri the surgery coaching group specifically. It, and maybe it's completely my misperception, but it sounded like perhaps some of the impetus for this was in technical aspects of surgery that people needed coaching for. And have we drifted too? Are we drifting too far away from that in this, these conversations? Is how do we how do we change a little bit from surgical coaching to wellness coaching, and and where do we draw the line when it's beyond what we're actually able to offer? 
Yeah, I think that's a really great question. Um, it, it's been fascinating for me having done this with a bunch of different organizations at this point. And I think what each organization focuses on is a little bit different depending on what the needs are of their membership. I would say in general, it's still about 50-50 in terms of people who come to coaching if they're looking for technical or if they're looking for more of the interpersonal and the stress management and those kinds of things. And so um, I, I, I think that the skill set is the same. Um, and it's really then about figuring out what each person needs and what they're struggling with at a given point in time in their practice. Um, I, I think we have to be careful drifting too far into some of the wellness coaching in some ways, just because again, you know, we're, we're here to support each other as peers and as colleagues, but in the amount of time that we're training coaches, we're not going to train people to be executive coaches or wellness coaches, right? We're going to teach surgeons how to ask good questions, give constructive feedback, have a more engaged conversation that it adheres to adult learning principles and uses coaching principles to increase engagement. But if somebody really is at a point where they need that sort of wellness, I think one of the things that we need to be aware of is knowing when people need to escalate and ask for help, right? And I think some of what we can do as peers is to help with that kind of insight and help people to understand where they're at in their practice. And is what you're feeling the normal stress we're all feeling with COVID or is it beyond that? And what kind of support do you need? Yeah, you know, I'm just going to make a statement. We're having some of these meetings um, and talking about coaching and how to select coaches and and what people are looking for. You know, I think I think as as Dr. Eagleton and Dr. Reed said that uh, everyone at any stage, you know, can use some coaching. You know, one of the members that was on the wellness committee said, you know, I, this this whole EMR, this whole EHR stuff is is just a pain. You know, and that's where a younger member who's very tech savvy can help somebody and say, look, this is how you do it, and this is how you be efficient about it. Whereas no, I think all of the stuff that we, we always consider about coaching is the technical aspect. But I do think I do think that there's a lot of technical aspects that leads to wellness. I mean, if you are an efficient surgeon and you can do a two hour operation in two hours and it's not taking you eight hours, everything in your life will get better. And I do think that these are things that we we have to remember. And I think sometimes people don't. And I think in training, sometimes as program directors, sometimes we we don't push that. You know, we don't push the efficiency in the operating room and things that you have to do to, to, to promote wellness. I think plus that, just that excitement and growth as a surgeon too, right? That feeling of I'm continuing to get better, which I think we sometimes lose as we get further and further out in our practice and we don't operate with other people and we're just kind of doing the same thing every day. Thanks for that discussion. I know I had asked you to talk about what makes a really successful relationship, but I also want to follow up on the, the the comment towards the technical focused coaching. And there were references, and I know our members will be curious, there were a lot of references to video coaching. Um, and so, you know, my, my question for our academy partners is, um, when you think about the role of video coaching, and I know a lot of the work we talked about early on was in the space of minimally invasive surgery, where you do have video kind of easily obtainable from these procedures. Um, what are your thoughts about institutional barriers or enablers to having that content available for sharing? Because starting with a case and starting with the conduct of an operation and talking about things technically, I think is a really, really easy place for surgeons to start. Um, I think we're all very comfortable talking in those terms. Um, but I will say, at least from my perspective here, I'm not sure that we're set up or equipped to kind of record the surgical proceedings, although maybe with our endovascular cases, there's um, cine loops and some other imaging that can be shared kind of nicely. But what are, what are your thoughts to that implementation or the absence of that with our particular specialty? Yeah, I, th I think that's a great question. So I personally see video very much as a tool. It's a way to anchor a conversation and you can do it just as easily by bringing in some angiograms and a case to talk about or, you know, some Thing that just gets, as you said, just starts as a comfort place that you can start in terms of a conversation to help you ground your conversation and really understand the person that you're working with, what their everyday practices like, what their cases are like. It just gives you a grounding for the conversation. I do think sometimes 
we get a little focused on the technical side because it is hard to record the videos. Um, and so there's a lot of variability right now in terms of what institutions have capacity to do and what um, people feel comfortable sharing. Um, as far as we can tell from all the lawyers we've spoken to, sharing a video in this setting is peer review and it really should be covered under all of the same uh, protections as any other type of peer review. But um, I would certainly encourage the membership if you don't have video or you don't have any Thing like that to share. Don't let that prevent you from signing up for coaching. Thanks. I think that's great. Any other thoughts from our Academy partners or any other um, kind of suggestions or comments on that pairing? So the, yeah, so the one thing I wanted to say about the pairing is it's really interesting. When we started doing this work, we were giving all of these instruments to all of our coaches and our participants and trying to figure out if introverts were better with extroverts or, you know, where you were on this scale and this scale. And, and what we actually ended up finding out was there were really no bad coaching interactions. Like we are all so starved to interact and collaborate with each other that literally we have never seen a bad coaching interaction. And so, you know, I would just encourage people to try it out. It's possible the first person that you match with might not be the perfect fit, but you can switch. Like you don't have to stay with somebody. And it's just like any other ways that we interact, right? We all have people we click with and people we don't. And it doesn't mean someone's a bad coach or a good coach or, uh, you know, a good surgeon or a bad surgeon. It's just a matter of finding that person that you trust. That's great. Thanks. The one other thing I'll say is I would love to see us continue to do research in that area, though, because I do think as this becomes more commonplace and the numbers get bigger, we may see trends where we can find things that are more or less productive. No doubt. That'll be really interesting to see how things work out within our society. We were intentional, I think, Dr. Singh and the leadership board and putting together a really kind of comprehensively diverse panel of coaches. So. Um, well, I think it's been a great discussion, um, and I really thank everybody for their contributions this evening, um, but really all of the, the work that's been going on behind the scenes to date to launch this program live. I also want to be mindful of everybody's time and respect that we're a bit after the hour, and so I guess I'll ask first from any of our panelists um, and from my co-moderator, Dr. Sheehan, does anybody have other questions or comments for the, for the group at large? No, I, I put it in a chat. I think this is a difficult format sometimes for people to ask questions. And so, you know, certainly feel free to reach out with me. I'm no expert on this, but I, I, uh, I happen to know some experts here. So uh, I can convey uh, any thoughts or comments to them uh, from anybody who's watching. Yeah, thanks for that, No. All right. Well, it looks like we're then coming to the end of our webinar session. Um, and so during the last hour, we've learned from A4SC how coaching improves physician wellness and the data to support it. Um, this is a really exciting and really innovative program that um, the, on behalf of the Wellness Task Force, we'd like to thank the leadership of the SVS for supporting. Um, and we truly hope that you've enjoyed the discussion this evening and learned a bit about, um, about the program available to everybody um, and how much we care about the wellness of our membership. So be well and stay safe and have a great evening, everybody. Thank you, Drs. Coleman and Sheehan, and thank you to all of our attendees and presenters for participating in this webinar. A coaching survey will be available, uh, which is a member's needs assessment. It'll be available tomorrow through LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. And the survey will also be available on Thursday through Pulse. We do ask that you take a few moments and complete the member needs assessment as your comments will help SVS plan future webinars. Thank you again for your participation. <laughs>